Buongiorno. So good morning. This is no isolated meeting. This is the first session of a day devoted to school, education, and to school in particular. We wanted to organize this session because we believe that education plays a central role and is very much in line with the title of the meeting because if you want to inherit from your fathers and regain again what you've inherited from your fathers, what you need is to have education and to be in a way uh, introduced to universal truth as uh, Father Giussani said in quoting uh, Jungmann. So we would like to start with this session. We're going to talk about a school, a school uh, to become adults, to then move on and have another session on uh, training and education, then another um, session on training. This afternoon, we're going to have another session on autonomy and equality. And then this afternoon at 9 45 p.m. We're going to have uh, a show entitled Padre e Figlio, so father and son, which basically draws upon the link between uh, education and training and relationships in the home. Uh, focused on personalities from the Bible. And uh, there's, going, there's going to be also the possibility to have a discount because uh, every 10 tickets, uh, one ticket will be free. We're going to listen to people working in the uh, school sector. We're going to listen to very authoritative, outstanding personalities. Before introducing them to you, we would like uh, to uh, greet us all, Minister Giovanni Berlinguer, who is uh, sitting as among us. He's in the first row and he's honoring us with his presence here. There is uh, a close friendship between us and uh, uh, President Berlinguer, Minister Berlinguer, and uh, we're very close to him because I believe that with his reform on reforms on autonomy and equality, uh, we owe him a lot. We would be glad, Giovanni, if you could kindly intervene after the speech is uh, uh, foreseen in the agenda. A contribution on your part would be much appreciated. So our school to become adults. The topic, the focus lies on the kind of education that can be provided by school. We have Anna Frigerio, the headmistress of uh, the uh, classical and scientific lyceum of the uh, Fondazione Sacro Cuore from Milan. Michele Monopoli, the headmaster of uh, the classical lyceum Cesare Beccaria, again also from Milan. Francesca Zanelli, a teacher at the Erasmo da Rotterdam uh, State Lyceum from Sesto San Giovanni, close to Milan, and Susanna Mantovani. She's a great friend, dear friend of mine, and a reference person, both humanly and professionally for me. She is an honorary professor of general pedagogy uh, at University Milano Bicocca, and she's one of the uh, most important, most uh, eminent scientific uh, uh, scholars in this field. I would like uh, to start this session with these slides. The slides you see tell us that over the last few years, uh, we focused on these topics, human capital and development, for example. And the slides are telling us that investing in education is not only important for life, uh, but it is one of the most important sources in development. Just have a look at this data. This data stems from uh, an international study. It was uh, carried out by Hanusek and Vosman. It highlights the link between the improvement and uh, uh, improvement in the education sector and GDP growth. So investing in education 
This is something that we continue repeating. Investing in education is uh, uh, at the core of development. If I were a minister, the first thing I would do would be to invest in education to improve the Italian GDP. And yet, most of the time, people say about the importance of this topic, but actually, this is the first factor for the development of a country. You see that the link is quite clear. And you see that those countries who's, uh, uh, who are currently witnessing a double-digit growth in uh, uh, their GDP growth, uh, namely Far uh, East countries, China, Taiwan, Singapore, for example, are actually the countries which over the last few years have invested the most in their school system. This is uh, quite evident. Uh, this is quite important evidence to tell us how investing in the school is very important. Furthermore, it has recently emerged from research that this increase is not only due to an improvement uh, in memory skills, uh, in cognitive skills, uh, so the non-cognitive skills uh, uh, has to be focused on, and Nobel Prize winners have namely shown that this improvement is linked to the so-called soft skills. And in a publication dating back to 2014, he talked about the so-called character skills, namely the skills linked to the personality, to the character of the person. Let me just mention a few, uh, for example, uh, the ones uh, that the American Society of Psychology mentioned as the most important ones, for example, the ability to work in team, responsibility, as well as uh, emotional stability, openness towards new experiences. These are terms that up to a few years ago were only related to the character, to the personality of a person. And today, we think the opposite. So personality has to deal with knowledge. This is quite revolutionary for the school system. This shows that these skills uh, were up to not long ago considered only uh, social skills or emotional skills uh, are in fact uh, quite importantly related to how we learn. And in the studies of these researchers, we can see that these skills are related to school performance, uh, to the completion of the school uh, cycles of the person, to working performance. Uh, so uh, Michael Douglas in Wall Street, uh, so the shark, uh, it is not necessarily true that he's the best at, at work. For a company, it's important that you also have this kind of uh, um, relationship-based uh, abilities organizations perform much better and this is uh, quite evident uh, also the exhibition on work uh, uh, that you see here at the meeting shows this really well or for example being having a positive attitude in life uh, if you develop this ability to withstand to show resilience in this case or for example behaviors uh, which are good behaviors uh, you may have people who are quite arrogant and appear to be better, but in fact, they might make use of drugs. They might use drugs. And so the, it's important to focus on healthy behaviors. Or, for example, being conscientious in one's studies and in work. Uh, we are witnessing uh, a revolutionary change in the way in which we think about school. It is not only the school that has to educate people or give us uh, tools that we can then develop in life as uh, if they were, uh, so to say, a sets of tools uh, that we can use in life, like Schumpeter said. Or you may have, for example, studies uh, uh, and the highlighted the importance of capabilities of character skills, uh, uh, namely focusing on the fact that young people have to be in touch with adults, telling them uh, uh, how important it is to collaborate with them and not uh, dictating them how to do things. Uh, or young people have to be, in a way, introduced, gradually introduced in working contexts. Uh, so training. Uh, smartness and intelligence and uh, the overall lifestyle of a person. This has to be provided by the school uh, context as well. So ultimately, the picture that you get from uh, school is that of a school that finds way to teach um, 
in ways that go much beyond some kind of a passive uh, uh, role of the learner vis-a-vis -vis an active role, dictating role of the teacher. And as a matter of fact, over the last few years, some credits provided at school are linked to social activities. And the school also must provide a common ground with the uh, families, paving the way for a more fruitful collaboration between subjects, between people, uh, with everyone contributing to the training of our uh, young people. So these are just some hints. Uh, uh, this is just some food for thought for our contributors because we're talking here about the very heart of tomorrow's society. So before leaving the floor to Francesca Zanelli, I would like to show you a video on what is taking place today in school. So, what were your most interesting moments in class? Ma the best and uh, most interesting moments in class is actually when professors uh, explain uh, why they like teaching. For me, it's when our teachers go more into details in certain topics and help us understand uh, how I can use a uh, given working method. Uh, it's important, the most interesting thing it, it when, uh, is when we did activities for our towns, so, for example, working in uh, common areas in Florence, uh, or when we staged the file stuff. Uh, what do you expect when you enter schools? When I enter school, I'm quite tired, uh, but actually I'm quite lazy, but I really hope that even if I'm lazy, I can still learn new things. The first thing I think when I uh, get in my school, into my school is that I can be welcomed by my schoolmates and that I can feel myself uh, among uh, friends. Uh, and then I, I look for affection and tenderness from my teachers. I hope I'm not uh, getting too much bored for at school. When I get in my school, what I am looking forward is that I, I have more knowledge after five hours of school. And I hope that I do not get bored during classes. And I hope uh, that I get good marks after a test. How should a school day be? Well, actually, uh, I hope uh, that I, uh, one day the teachers can help us organize ourselves a class uh, with a topic uh, of our choice. That we can do playful activities and funny activities to learn even better. Have school subjects changed you? School subjects are like small steps. And any time you manage uh, to actually understand these subjects, uh, you are capable of uh, uh, doing the steps, of ga de getting higher. And you are never able of uh, being firm in, the, in these schools, because whenever you go to school, you always learn something new, and you always keep moving. I realize that the subject has changed me when this subject uh, in a way affects my daily life and can influence my problems and helps me solve them. I understand that a subject has uh, changed me when it induces me to think about myself. What's important for us, what matters for us, especially in these last years of the Lyceum, is that we can deeply understand subjects and the usefulness of these subjects uh, for our life. I realize that a subject has changed me when I am uh, more confident of myself. And I do the same when I'm happy of myself. Francesca. In tra when I enter a school, I would like to think, what are we going to do today? These are the words of a second grade Lyceum student. And another student says, I uh, expect school to give me something that changes myself. This is the same reason why I go to school. School needs to be in contact with life. It needs to bring something new, a significant experience. 
But this need, does it turn into a question? And how am I moved by it? How do I react? In my school, <clears throat> this uh, educational uh, process uh, has been acknowledged by many people of different uh, cultural and uh, um, personal uh, background and so well I've started to think about uh, who could give me, give me the necessary tools to uh, carry out my task. If I think about uh, last year at school I remember a series of emergencies that we have faced every single day. Well these were positive emergencies that uh, uh, provoked us that were actually a reason for growth for us and for the kids. The, the most urgent challenges were the difficulty in accepting the rules and some learning problems. A girl came to my office because she needed to uh, start school the next uh, year having uh, studied from home previously because she has school phobia so well that this girl was labeled as a girl who uh, is not capable of living like the others and she says well I wanted to go back uh, to school as soon as possible and then well I told her well going back to school is not easy it's not something you can do just like that so you need to to study now for your exams and you have to come back only and if you are really sure you want to come back and this sort of changed their expression completely and says well you are the first person to tell me something like this everyone every single person tells me you may must make an effort what happened uh, she has been in a way helped by what I said because uh, she felt she was legitimate. Uh, she was uh, acknowledged in her dignity of uh, a free thinking person. So we need to look at our students, listen to our students, but we have to be open to uh, change the project we have for them. We have to look at them as a whole persons and we need to go and uh, take them from the uh, place they are and then accompany them along a path uh, which we do not know where it's going to, to take us. So this is the only thing that can help uh, this girl at the moment. Uh, obviously, she will have to take her exams, she will have to pass her exams, which are difficult exams. A student wrote, I understand that we need to follow the school curriculum, uh, but if I remember right, at the beginning of last year, some schoolmates started to debate about wars, and our uh, teacher listened uh, attentively to what they were saying. That's when I thought that I really hoped school was like that for the rest of the year. So this very simple thought makes it uh, uh, clear that our involvement is extremely important in this educational relation with uh, the students. A colleague once wrote to me, as a former student, uh, I am asking you to uh, keep alive your will to teach students and to have a relationship with them because it is this will them that makes a difference because on the contrary we are often in a situation where it is not so easy to do so as a father Giussani said persons in our times are not seen as tools of knowledge and change because they are seen knowledge as an analytical reflection and change as something that is based on rules. So well, this is what makes me think that we need to understand that students need to have a will to understand, to learn. <clears throat> Pasolini said that these were risky and thrilling emo um, nuances. So if this is uh, true, uh, it becomes even truer 
today when uh, uh, students uh, seem to escape reality. Um, as Father Caron said, uh, young people cannot acknowledge reality. So while well, this uh, transfer of contents uh, is not enough, uh, it has a lot of limits uh, today, more than it did in the past, because we need more uh, than just uh, transferring knowledge. A young girl with a so-called dysfunctional family who had failed her exams, every morning when she wakes up, she really needs to make an effort, an effort to come to school, and she is often absent, or she comes uh, later when she's in class, she cannot concentrate, she doesn't do her homeworks, she doesn't want to be helped by her schoolmates and uh, well this obviously makes her uh, self-esteem uh, poorer well uh, one morning uh, after uh, the uh, mid-term evaluation she was uh, moving in front uh, of me and I I heard her saying, I could actually have uh, good marks in your subject, subject because you made me see that I could make it. So this is exactly uh, the uh, what we have to do. We have uh, to focus on the value of these uh, students, values that they often do not know they have. So well, there are different methods that have to be applied to different people, and uh, uh, my self um, and the selves of all the students need to be present in the uh, class. Father Caron says that the only hope for uh, young people is that uh, uh, these, pe these young people are uh, seen as uh, something new, something different. This girl I was talking about has a lot of problems in English. See, English lessons are always the first class of the day, so she often comes uh, later, and uh, well, she could uh, really be risking to drop out. So the situation is really risky. So I make a final attempt, and uh, I uh, dare err uh, uh, on what. Uh, is most difficult for her, that is to say, to abide by the rules. So, well, I ask her to make an effort to come in at the, for the first class on Mondays, Wednesday, and Friday, Fridays to attend the English class. So after a while, she improves in English. So, well, I think we cannot ask a student like this everything all at the same time. We would have lost her if we did so. Uh, so this is a, a very realistic uh, strategy uh, which doesn't uh, take into account the existing schemes because uh, uh, these uh, students then understand that they have the tools to uh, learn about reality. In this case, uh, this uh, student uh, took up the challenge and, uh, well, she obviously had a lot of work to do. There is another example, a younger girl uh, doesn't seem to understand that she has problems at school, so she would probably fail the year. Uh, then uh, she even uh, takes, in, takes into consideration the possibility to change school. But she says she's not interested in anything at all. So well, what we do, we just uh, sit together and uh, start to analyze the different schools existing, existing in our uh, region. And then we find uh, a professional institute, and she says that, that that is exactly what she wanted to do. But uh, her parents had imposed upon her a different choice. And when she leaves my office, she is relieved. After a few hours, her mom calls me and she says that she is amazed by the change in her daughter. She really uh, is uh, now uh, very motivated. She says, I don't want to fail the year. I will have uh, subjects and exams in uh, September. And uh, then I will choose not to take these exams, but to change school, to change school for the institute and the kind of school that I want to, to attend. So, well, this is, is something that is not extraordinary. Then there was another student uh, that went home and uh, said, uh, 
and told her mom, uh, my teacher looked at me as if I uh, were a good student. Well, uh, this is what also uh, Father Giussani said about uh, the educational risks. If there is just one uh, point of light in millions of dark points, this has to be valorized. Sometimes the reason of the efforts of the young people who feel inadequate uh, is due to the fact that we pass on negative messages because we are too much concerned about the final result instead of the uh, growing and developing process. So this is wrong because we need to create motivation because and in the end the results will be will be good. Well that this motivation is, is a struggle because it has to be conquered by um, studying and then there is a moment when everything is light and uh, everyone can benefit from this. Once at the theater we uh, we had studied uh, the uh, work of Omer for months and months, and then we went to the theater for a show. And when, at a certain moment uh, during a monologue, uh, the young girl, a younger girl said, that's me. And well, I was embarrassed, but I did understand what she meant. The actors went to thank this girl at the end of the show, but say, by saying that this meant that the uh, show was a success. So we really need uh, to uh, leave these students free to run their own race so that uh, uh, we uh, realize that uh, uh, they can do what we expect them to do. So we need to learn again how to teach which doesn't mean that we have to throw away our heritage, but we have to measure it against what is happening every day, changing direction if needed. Um, schools of every kind can become a growing experience, an experience of change if we teachers are moved not by the students in general, but by those students that have a certain skills which we don't know, uh, knowing that they have a value, knowing that we cannot control their freedom, and, uh, and if we want to conquer with them the object of knowledge, which is extremely necessary in this moment with this change of era, as Pope Francis said, uh, now that it is very difficult to trust reality. Thank you. Una scuola da grandi. So a school for the adults. Uh, this actually already implies the goal to achieve. A school made for the adults, uh, so adults who are already adults and for people who are becoming adults. I think that this perspective already gives a parameter for the evaluation of the school. A school is such if it introduces a method. In other words, uh, if it gives uh, the meaning of oneself as a discovery and as development and the search for what can help us uh, achieving this goal. This is uh, not all and actually I think uh, that the school shouldn't, uh, the only area where our uh, own uh, consciousness grows, but it plays a fundamental role in this. We live in a complex uh, era, and so thinking about the school and sharing experiences uh, on school, as well as the reciprocal help we can give each other, are urgent matters. But in order for this to become fruitful, uh, a fruitful discussion, and not just a mere explanation of goals, I think the school has to clarify the horizon within which it work should be set. The intensive work with teachers on the meaning of uh, how we work and on the possibility of uh, checking its outcomes in the uh, pupils uh, actually finds orientation and guidance in what Paul Francis says and does. But there are some things that should be highlighted. They've been enlightening for us, especially during this last year uh, of school, because they clearly uh, express uh, the need to achieve a precise goal. And one hint actually is contained in the speech given, pronounced to the journalists on the occasion of uh, a given issue, of issue number 4000 of the magazine. Uh, the Pope invites journalists uh, 
to actually have some kind of an incomplete thought, meaning a thought which is not rigid, which is not strict. So Pope Francis actually focuses very much on opening one's ideas. Only if one has open ideas, then can we better face the crisis and understand where the world is going. And only in this way can we understand how we can best face today's challenges, geopolitical challenges, for example, or the challenge of my Migrations, which is the real political problem of our days. Uh, openness is very important for the Pope, and imagination is equally important. And he pronounced uh, important, extraordinary words and says uh, that he likes uh, uh, poetry very much uh, and that he continues reading poems because poems contain lots of metaphors. Understanding metaphors help us making our thought uh, agile, intuitive, flexible and acute. Those who have imagination do not become uh, uh, rigid towards uh, humor, but they in a way enjoy uh, blessing uh, and internal freedom. Those who do so are capable of having large visions even in uh, small closed uh, surroundings. So this is very fascinating. This has a very powerful educational message. And above all, this clearly shows the intimate relationship uh, with that openness of reason that is that was strongly focused uh, on by uh, Father Giussani. So an open reason uh, that is really very important for us as teachers vis-a-vis -vis our pupils. Uh, Educating in schools today means uh, giving a contribution to the growth of open people who are well aware of their uh, wealth and their values uh, in the multiplicity of the different ways that we have at our disposal to express ourselves. And how can this be done? It's not easy to, in a way, uh, to document what uh, takes place at school. Lots of uh, activities uh, are carried out in uh, uh, small areas in small surroundings uh, uh, but they these areas the schools are actually the daily uh, venue where these people uh, perform their lives uh, every morning when i join uh, when i enter school and when i meet my colleagues uh, or, for example, when I greet my students, I am aware of the fact uh, that for each of these pupils, for each of these students, something exceptional is about to start. And that is why I'm always grateful whenever a, a professor, a teacher or uh, a pupil uh, wants to tell me an important event that has taken place, maybe a minor event, maybe a minor thing that has marked an increase in knowledge for him or her. First and foremost, human knowledge. Knowledge can throw light, can cast light on what we do, or it can open up uh, interesting horizons. At the end of the school year, after a uh, school day, I met uh, a pupil uh, in his last year of Lyceum who told me about the good result uh, of uh, a history uh, test. And I was very happy about that because the student was not particularly uh, willing to, to study, so to say. But he was very, I was very pleased because in the end he told me that things uh, in the end uh, that he was able to make uh, uh, things uh, have a meaning so the very fact that a student told me this uh, and that he fully grasped uh, this pathway was very pleasing because he was helped to enter the complexity of individual subjects of the relationships between the various uh, areas of knowledge and this uh, thanks to the support of people who helped uh, uh, him open his heart and his mind, who did not simply pose reassuring questions, uh, answers to questions that were not uh, posed, but uh, rather uh, by educators who managed to have students ask the right questions, exactly like the students in the video. I think uh, I should be clear on this. Uh, this uh, um, satisfaction is not an intellectual kind of satisfaction. Uh, uh, what the student told me testified to the fact that the, the possible confusion he had in his mind could be won over and that this person could find a place in the world. So here lies the origin of self-esteem. Many young people sometimes lack uh, self-esteem. Uh, 
actually this can be overcome in having a broad horizon of meaning and it is uh, the relationship with uh, an adult with a teacher having an open uh, mind uh, an incomplete thought like the pope said can be done and this is something that uh, young people can perceive we live in a culture that apparently trivializes desire trivializes wish but wish and desire is like a fire under the ashes and it's there to be ignited again young people are able to uh, get enthusiastic for good things for great things when they see that they are incorporating the experience of people uh, just let me make an example. During uh, a meeting of teachers, uh, there was a professor, a teacher, who basically pointed out that explaining literature for her coincides in discovering that literature text with her pupils. Uh, and actually realism, in other words, facing reality in all its implications, does not exclude, but rather includes mystery. These words, the words of this colleague of mine, made me understand that uh, in uh, uh, getting knowledge, uh, the important thing is that you get sense uh, and mystery at the same time. So what I wanted to tell you is an example of what it means uh, uh, taking care of the person w uh, in doing school. So doing school, teaching, uh, and at the same time taking care of the person. This is unrenounceable. The witness of the pupils in the video showed this very clearly. This is the common ground where relations, uh, so subjects uh, is the common ground where relations can be established. Uh, and uh, it is details that can make the difference. Some weeks ago, a um, maths professor sent me an email uh, wrote, written by a student of hers to thank her for uh, her work. And the final sentence of this mail was, you taught me a lot, you taught me well, thank you. And so I wondered, uh, what did he, this young people mean when he said, uh, you taught me well, what does it mean to teach well? And in this case too, I cannot but make reference to the many uh, encounters uh, and dialogues I've had with the teachers in my school, especially when we often wondered uh, what we are aiming at when we enter our classroom. Uh, two remarks are worth mentioning here. First of all, what we do, we, uh, we check if uh, that what we've done uh, is good if we do the teaching and basically we can uh, uh, do our best. In other words, when a young person understands what it means to mean demonstrating, well then the subject is teaching him demonstrating. What I share with the students is not so much the subject but rather the relationship with that subject. Second remark, in facing texts, uh, I actually focus on the question, on the why. Why is the author focusing in a given, on a given passage? Content cannot be my only aim. I'm much more interested in students to have the tools to critically and freely uh, see what is proposed to them. Uh, up until actually they do not swear on the word of their uh, teachers. And how can children find uh, reality interesting? Uh, reality becomes interesting because there is a link between reality and themselves. And this link consists not so much in contents, but rather in this question on the why. So there is a common element uh, between these considerations which come from different uh, aims. So a young person grows up not so much uh, because he learns things, uh, but they grow uh, because they've discovered learning some things and they've learned a little bit more of themselves. They have the chance uh, of understanding uh, what touches them and we could go on forever. And what's decisive here uh, is investing in freedom. Lately, the educational dialogue is a dialogue between freedoms, freedoms uh, that basically focus on a given interpretation of uh, reality. A philosophy teacher once acutely observed that in 
her classes. She pays attention in trying to uh, personify with all the positions proposed by authors, even if these positions are very far from uh, uh, the professor's sensitivity or that of the students. Personifying with the author enables to understand facets of one's experience which uh, are still unknown and which can be disclosed thanks to the encounter of the authors. And then on the other hand, uh, the teacher wishes his pupils uh, to learn that it takes esteem and depth to, in a way, exchange and encounter different views. A pupil has to, in a way, welcome the hypothesis and see his own hypothesis, his own assumption welcomed. So communicating, di having a dialogue with the freedom of the other means that we're taking the other uh, seriously, that we're defying him to, in a way, uh, arguing for his case. We're talking, we're not talking about uh, rhetorics uh, because verifying an assumption involves an intimate level of the person and therefore establishes a deep relationship and a significant relationship based on real good. So teaching well cannot but simply giving a, a lot of information to the other person. Teaching well means accompanying a young person to discover his humanity and not just the traits of his intelligence but his own humanity. So I'm, al I'm always reassured when I meet uh, teachers that uh, believe the same. During a recent encounter with a former colleague uh, um, where I used to taught to teach what was the reason of such passion. Uh, that uh, teacher had already, had just written a, an important article for a newspaper, and that is the reason why I wanted to meet this teacher. My question was immediately answered. She said to give the words, to give pupils through the words of big authors to discover themselves. I mean, one can have different, very different cultural uh, orientation, like, for example, in, uh, as was the case uh, with this colleague. Uh, but uh, there is something that can bring us together, and it is love for one's own humanity and the humanity of the pupils entrusted to us. I also think it is, impulse, it is possible to, in a way, identify elements uh, uh, of common ground, a common ground uh, when there is love towards what we're doing. And let me give you yet another example. At the end of the uh, final examinations, uh, high, s high school examinations, I like to meet my teachers uh, to have an exchange of views and to see if there's something that should be better valued or maybe modified. And our discussions are always very interesting. Uh, there are also, there's also lots of critical points which emerged. And the same happened this year. There was a teacher who did, uh, who highlighted some elements, some criticalities, and then once he then, she then told me that what strikes me, that they end up their school with passion. This is nothing obvious. They've discovered something that they want to go more into, the, into details and that they're happy when they finish high school. This made me think of a dialogue I had with some uh, um, young people whom I had invited to my home after the high school um, test. Uh, and actually, I asked them what was the most important element in their educational pathway. And they briefly answered, first of all, solving problems. Uh, and then secondly, starting together, learning together, as was always suggested to us by our professors, uh, and as we see that they also do. I think these are the essential traits of that open mind that we were talking about at the beginning. In other words, not being afraid of complexity, uh, being in need of company, and perceiving the other as someone important, sharing a task, supporting each other in, in difficult tasks, uh, seeing the example of our masters. So I am aware of the fact that the, the sum of all the actions and the, the intentions that make up a, work, a school day cannot completely explain what's taking on and that the outcome of such an effort uh, uh, implies sometimes mistakes. We all know how uh, painful it can be to make mistakes with a, a young person. This is something that can be seen only over time and one needs to be patient. So that is why I'm always 
free. I'm always uh, very much struck by the gratuity element that is so typical of our work. Uh, sometimes one has the impression that the words and the gestures are not perceived. One would like to have an immediate response. Uh, one would have our actions to be confirmed immediately. Apparently, everything uh, is uh, still and uh, the, the feeling of being inadequate sometimes prevails, but it is also in this apparent silence that one surprisingly gets and becomes adult. Thank you. Good afternoon, good, good morning, everyone, and thank you for the invitation. The questions that this uh, year's meeting poses are really crucial. They lead us uh, to think about the reality that we live in with new events that uh, make us have responsibility we didn't have in the past. So there is also a problem of uh, uh, well, safeguard of the past, but we also have the duty to change, to introduce something new in society and culture. But when change becomes very quick, these two functions of school, that is to say to transfer the past and to prepare for the future, become contradictory. And uh, how can we build the future in a society where uh, great certainties have died and has been defined by the sociologist uh, Mark Auger, the society of the known places. And uh, this means that we have uh, places like the big shopping malls, for instance, that are completely new. Changes, change is the only sure thing. Uncertainty is the only certainty. Uh, so school, uh, which and its uh, working depends on uh, the strength, the democratic and economic strength of a country. How can school face a reality where the culture develops in a way that is slower than change? Reality seems to be less uh, comprehensible than in the past. The future is uh, too difficult to foresee, to manage. In this uh, time of ours that is marked by uh, transition and uncertainty, a society that doesn't have uh, rules and, uh, well, here education needs to, uh, in a way, be finalized to give uh, people uh, a power and uh, an energy that makes them uh, capable of uh, face the challenges of everyday life. So there is a, 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 ra a respectful interaction between generations where families, just like schools, should educate children uh, to responsibility and uh, autonomy. So according to an existing definition, uh, we know that we are uh, born and we live in a certain uh, historical time that cannot be repeated. And in this case, in our case, that cannot be foreseen. We can get lost when facing the in almost problems of our times. The present uh, amazes us and concerns us and scares us with events like the terroristic attacks. And it uh, surprises us with uh, the uh, constant development of uh, the internet. And uh, so, well, these are two contemporary monsters that are fighting over our uh, intelligence. The, on the one uh, hand, we have a closure, and on the other, we have uh, the total openness. Uh, terrorism hits uh, the uh, autonomy that is uh, so important for uh, young people, and it goes against the young people. Uh, oh, autonomy, as Eto Mauro said, is uh, represented by the mm, backpack that all young people have, uh, but it becomes uh, um, well a, 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 a burden of fears, something that we have to fight against. Uh, parents and uh, children, uh, teachers and students have to 
fight together with uh, uh, um, an open mind and a stronger heart. We have uh, to uh, be open to the changes that experience and life uh, make necessary for us. We need to defend our uh, civil organization, our free time, the creation of uh, social encounters and relationships and uh, <coughs> friendships uh, professional uh, uh, and uh, cultural uh, relationships. So as uh, Mauro said, we have to give uh, the backpack back to our uh, young people with its uh, simple burden of daily freedom, the freedom of new generations that uh, is experiencing this very fluid uh, world and uh, is finding new ways and uh, finding the benefits of what we call uh, the ethics of the uh, travelers, that is to say the generations of the Erasmus exchanges, of uh, uh, new professions, of uh, um, people traveling a lot uh, on business so these are the citizens of the future they will have to create a society that is based on solidarity and subsidiarity with a common sense of belonging to a global world so we should not forget that we have a lot to defend the universal values of democracy and freedom that Europe and the West are the uh, guardians and uh, uh, that need to be defended by looking at the world as it is and not as uh, it should be. So this is a, a time of great migration flows, a phenomenon that we have to face every single day. We believe that this is uh, something that is uh, just uh, typical of this uh, period of uh, time, uh, but actually uh, migration flows have always been there in uh, during uh, the history of mankind. Uh, Maurizio Bettini, uh, who is a university professor, uh, says that uh, Virgilius said in his work that uh, there were a uh, people who moved because they had less lost their children and wives and parents, just like the refugees that arrive now and land on our shores and have experienced the same tragedies. So we have uh, uh, known all the uh, migrant people of the past, Byzantine, uh, Celtics and so on and so forth. And uh, so this is uh, actually in a way the heritage of our forefathers from uh, uh, faraway lands, uh, Greeks, uh, Etruscan and so on and so forth and uh, so this makes our uh, land uh, varied and uh, uh, with all its uh, uh, cultural uh, traditions and uh, so who are these young people that we have to uh, to support and who are we who should actually uh, be the parents, the guide? Is this uh, a generation gap and who is responsible for it? Is it true that the majority of our young people are as they are described, that is to say young people without ideals and values, with no interest in the world, that do not know anything about history and politics that are too attached to um, uh, material uh, goods, uh, uh, spoiled, uh, uh, unable to make sacrifices, uh, weak, without uh, uh, desires, self-centered, uh, incapable of uh, facing uh, traumas and tragedies. Well, uh, uh, statistic research actually say that this is, is not true. And uh, uh, as uh, a teacher and as a professor, I must say that I do not agree with this. Uh, intergenerational um, phases uh, need to be uh, seen as a, a moment of a change. Uh, it, if our young people are different from our from us and our parents, this doesn't mean that they are worse than that than we are. So, what? How can we actually earn again what our fathers have lived and experienced? If we stop imposing our living model, it will be easier for us to give back. Uh, what we want to give to our young people, and uh, this uh, would uh, lead to an 
to a society that is closer to the principles of civilization. If it is true that culture uh, is, uh, can only benefit uh, from the confrontation between fathers and, so and children, uh, teachers and students, well, this is, is, it is also true that this should not lead uh, to a, a breakup. Uh, so, well, uh, we have the right and the duty to um, establish rules, but they shouldn't be too rigid. Uh, and uh, young people want to redefine these rules, but uh, in the, the respectful interaction with those who have issued these rules in the first place, without utopia, uh, without uh, unnecessary fights and struggles. So the school of today uh, needs to be uh, the uh, engine of diversity. It doesn't have to be something something that uh, aims at homogeneity and uh, so we need to show that uh, it is possible to live in this world with different uh, uh, lifestyles, uh, so no models but rather more uh, closeness, uh, uh, an open mind without a nostalgia for what we used to be in the past and for what we would want young people to become in the future. In one of his works, Father Dusani wrote, and I quote, the risk resides in the capability of put ourselves uh, at stake, ready to accept also something that could uh, uh, really change our life, get free uh, from our heritage of fathers and mothers and teachers, and uh, give young people the necessary room to make uh, themselves uh, express what they really are and their needs, their fears, their potential. Look at them as persons that are unique as persons and uh, not just like uh, clones of our desires and expectations. Freeing them from our need to protect them and show them the way, uh, but rather accompanying them in the discovery of reality with their own tools. Those tools that we look at as dangers, but that are actually uh, growth opportunities. This is what Father Giussani wrote. So we need to open up uh, uh, new opportunities of uh, dialogue, which doesn't mean that we have to give up our authority as adults. So there has to be a, a contribution to this global communication that is the reality in which our students work and live. Uh, so. Uh, uh, the web, uh, the social media, uh, so apparently uh, the, uh, see the life they live is more superficial, but it is not true. So the, uh, our young people do not fear the uh, comparison with their parents like the, we did in the 60s. So some say, someone says that this is uh, the triumph of uh, uh, the, a certain lack of uh, away, so to speak, but uh, uh, we have uh, to take into account uh, everything that is part of our life in a, a landscape that is not uh, men-centered. And uh, young people can rewrite this in a new language, a language that doesn't have to uh, replace the myth of uh, complexity that was uh, grown by previous ger generations. So we need uh, to have families and the school that, uh, and adults who abandon uh, their uh, self-centered vision, uh, abandon their codes and finally um, discover new values and ideals like the eternal values uh, of the right uh, to life. Saverius Gavoy in his work wrote today uh, the heart of uh, is the door that takes us uh, to the minds of young people. So if we want uh, to face the educational challenge, we need by educating our hearts and help young people to manage their emotions and their feelings, cultivating their uh, positive passions. So let's take them by the hand and lead them to the path that uh, builds their own way of thinking, uh, taking uh, uh, what we can from our cultural heritage without imposing uh, a, a 
cold way of learning. Uh, let's try to guide them uh, among that great uh, way of uh, information that comes from uh, the net. So let's uh, teach them what research means, what uh, um, reflection mean, otherwise there won't be any quality hierarchy. Plato wrote that it was necessary to trigger uh, the flame of uh, philosophy, but this is true for any subject. If we really love the subject we teach and if we know it in depth, we can actually have this trigger uh, in uh, young people in an intense exchange of desire, curiosity and love for everything good that uh, the uh, human being could create in the past and is uh, still creating today, everywhere, with no hierarchies, with no priorities. Uh, so this is a desire that will last um, more than anything else. And uh, this uh, uh, desire for uh, knowledge will make young people uh, curious and make them and will make will turn them into citizens of the world. In the past, education believed that desire was a threat that had to be contained, that had uh, to be controlled. The desire of education is, on the contrary, a resource. That is what adults should uh, pass on to the younger. Uh, they, we need to uh, struggle against uh, cynicism with uh, hope, uh, which doesn't mean a naive uh, optimism, but rather the presence of a hope in reality. So this is a great responsibility for education. We need to replace fear with hope, supported by knowledge. In periods of great violence, we run the risk to go back to a black and white mentality that doesn't have the nuances imposed by the real situation to face difficult problems, looking for simple solutions and answers that can uh, respond to our fears makes it possible to uh, overcome uh, this distinction between a good world and a bad world. So there is a risk that only knowledge can actually avoid. Identity and dialogue, these are uh, two interconnected words. In an intercultural period such as this one, we need to create open identities uh, capable of uh, uh, integration, dialogue. We need uh, to uh, reject any form of, of closure, discrimination, nation. And then a final aspect, uh, that is to say, the so-called difficult young people. Uh, this is a theme that I have already dealt with in different uh, contexts. These are uh, often young people who have uh, uh, problems that are not easy to see uh, and which we do not see as adults. but. Uh, they can have uh, uh, also some tragical consequences because uh, as uh, we read that we cannot, uh, we haven't been able to see the blossoming uh, side of these uh, uh, young people to see in order to uh, teach. This is, seems uh, simple, but it is not. And the hindrances are the educational models that are based on uh, a knowledge that is not uh, uh, suitable for the multimodality of today's world. So we need to have a vision of the world where uh, specialistic languages can interact in their richness. And then the last question I would like to try to answer. If the future is based on integration and plurality, this, is this something that uh, concerns only the Western culture? The presence of Muslim uh, immigrants obviously creates some kind of problem. That is to say, uh, the encounter between cultures, the dialogue, the religious dialogue, the uh, Islamic component, uh, unfortunately, is seen as a threat, uh, something that we have to solve. So school, the school and, uh, well, all the educational systems should see this as a great opportunity, the opportunity to discover uh, these ancient cultures and to find back our common origins, our common roots. So we have uh, mutual debts and uh, uh, with these uh, civilizations that are represented by these men, women, and children that arrive here uh, with nothing and uh, rich only uh, in their culture and their history and land on our shores looking for some peace and a future. 
we need to think about, back about the roots uh, of the history of the Mediterranean and uh, the encounter of uh, civilizations and peoples. The Arab Islamic civilization is uh, the, uh, well, gave the origins to the Greek and Roman civilization. And these peoples actually <coughs> safeguarded this civilization. Francesco Gabrielli, a great historian, a European historian, says that the West and the East are integral part of the history of man and there is a continuity that is expressed by uh, the slogan by Goethe that is West, the West and the East should not be separated. So this is not a civil, civilization clash. Uh, there are other problems, problems that are of economic origins, uh, the control of uh, 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 resources, of raw materials. So this has nothing to do with a civilization clash, which is actually used as a pretext, so to speak. So uh, education uh, should actually um, spread humanism and uh, this is uh, a way to uh, uh, counter this uh, attempt at make us less human so this uh, is the place where our young people can um, understand that they uh, belong to the same community that of man this is the value of a global uh, uh, society where everyone can find their place in the world. This, I believe, is the scenario where we have to develop a, a, an intergenerational um, encounter. This is the challenge to build the school for adults, the title of our meeting today. A challenge that involves teachers, students, and their families, all uh, pursuing a, an objective which is a valuable objective, that is to say, to share the dream uh, of who said that the greatest event of the future will be the creation of a, a collective humanitarian uh, conscience, a change that is based on global humanism uh, that can uh, see the complexity of mankind. Maybe this is a dream, but it is the only perspective we have to pursue. So I asked Giorgio Vitadini when, uh, when he asked me to participate in this event what, I, what he wanted me to focus on and actually he answered in a very direct and brief way and said educating young people to reasoning and to freedom. And actually, and this in just a few minutes and after what we have um, just listened to, this is uh, quite difficult and what I've heard uh, induced me to make notes. So what I'm going to tell you, uh, probably going to be a little bit more confused. Uh, I'd like to share with you some ideas which will probably be less, in th uh, less thrilling, so to say, but probably more in line with what we heard. I believe uh, the following. First of all, I think that the school I would like to talk about today, especially uh, the type of school we've experienced over the last few years uh, uh, that uh, I uh, am thinking about with my university students, uh, especially when I, um, when I meet my students uh, whom I ask to go back to school. This school should have uh, the following tasks. First of all, meeting people, having an exchange with people and rebalancing the experiences that people, young girls and boys, uh, make outside the school. And this school is some, some kind of an arena where they can learn essential tools to understand the environments and the complex contexts where they live. So learning environments uh, in broad terms uh, and living contexts, uh, so cultural contexts, uh, it goes uh, uh, from this point of view that I would like uh, uh, to think about the functions which, in my opinion, are more urgent uh, to which should be more 
thought about. And today, it is inevitable to address the idea of a school which is shorter. Uh, but also focusing on international uh, experiences. This is not the task of this uh, meeting. This is not uh, probably the way to think about these topics, but these topics, in other words, less school time, reduce school time, and other uh, additional international experiences can be um, additional thoughts that add on uh, to the complexity of what I would like to say. So the time, the time we spend with our children, the time of life and the time of school. I want to believe uh, that the schools, uh, that the, the girls and boys uh, that attend high school have already had lots of opportunities to think, to ponder, to in a way communicate in school, not only outside school on the experiences of other people and on their own experiences, on the experiences they have learned also, uh, for example, in history, in literature. Uh, and this is, these are notes uh, that I added after that. And also, for example, in the uh, experiences, uh, in the experience of going more into the details uh, from the questions posed by O sciences and all disciplines and I also hope that these young people have understood that in order to grow up and be free experience must become an occasion of analysis of thought of rigorous study that's a starting point and of uh, uh, an exchange and as a tool it must be mastered in order to in a way to become fruitful and help these young people become uh, uh, better capable of having uh, advanced, more advanced ideas and acquire critical thinking. This is very important. Experience, uh, when we analyze experience, uh, when we try and communicate this experience and share it with others, uh, well, then it becomes thought and it gets transformed. And it is still pregnant as it used to be at the beginning, but it gets transformed. So my question is, uh, it's a question which is kind of provocative. Uh, do you think that the daily events uh, that many young people and many adults constantly post on their social tools, is that experience? I don't think it is experience. Uh, these are just, this is just deformations of the experience. Uh, and actually by this, I m by experience, uh, we only mean something that requires attention, thought, uh, analyzed uh, within oneself and then shared with the other. So I hope that the young people going to school have not lost the intensity of uh, pregnant, uh, um, uh, of interesting uh, experience, experiences, which are the ones that actually I, study every day and which sometimes appear to mm, seem to disappear which in many young people seem to disappear sometimes this is also reminded to us by university students so are we trained to go more into the details of this experience through common analysis I think this is the condition sine qua non to develop uh, reasoning uh, uh, critical thinking so I hope we have met, uh, I hope these young people have met uh, uh, adults that have had the capability of guiding them, and this is fundamental. How can this be done? How can we make things to, in a way, stay together, as was said before? We might get eluded from the fact that the systematic study of disciplines like, for example, philosophy, maths, uh, history, sciences, arts, uh, humanities, uh, that this study gives us uh, models to, to think, to reason, or the experience of the necessary time to, in a way, uh, grasp uh, complex topics. Uh, this is very important and in my opinion this is not enough. The school must play a complementary role because reasoning and thinking require time and this time should not be fragmented, it should be protected. This should be a good fatigue, good effort. Uh, for example, as happens when you are uh, hiking up in the mountains, uh, in order not to get lost, uh, 
not to get confounded and that you uh, have the chance to go in depth. So the time for this analysis is uh, an absolute urgency of the school world. So meeting disciplines and the contents that we as teachers choose inside disciplines uh, uh, to submit to uh, young people must be um, chosen as occasions to think, uh, to induce people to think, to have fruitful exchange of views on how we work, uh, uh, how, for example, reasoning uh, goes on smoothly, and when it does on go on smoothly, uh, why? I'm going back to this word. Actually, we should there is a useful and nice word that we should mention, which is conversation, the, so to say, reclaiming conversation. There is a beautiful uh, text on that. It is not easy to have a nice conversation on topics, uh, to then discuss these topics uh, in an animated way, thereby um, in a way, listening to ourselves and reasoning in an articulated and a complex way. I think there should be time and a priority way and discussion of how we can talk together, uh, not between those who know and those who don't know, but rather knowing and discussing about what we study and how we can think about that. This is a priority of the school work because this experience uh, uh, given the world we live in and given the influence of other tools uh, that uh, uh, fill our lives, uh, is so the time to do that is rare. We should find the time to do that uh, in school. In some of the classes uh, we've uh, probably heard, probably yes, but not too often, we should lead uh, and guide conversations that help uh, young people think, uh, inducing them uh, uh, to think uh, um, free uh, as, uh, in a way, uh, animated people and in peace. I've had the chance to, for example, watch Chinese children who um, discuss in an animated way in China. I was involved in an educational project. Uh, I was part of the Italian group. And we, as Italians, are seen as uh, uh, animated uh, speakers. Uh, so the fact, uh, this cultural trait uh, that characterizes the way in which we talk uh, can be sometimes uh, confounded and uh, induce people to think that we are in a way angry or not, that we do not agree with the others. Uh, we should not, uh, we should have a good metaphor and not only do there was a colleague of mine, uh, expert in Chinese culture and Chinese language, and he told me that the closest word to the word conversation actually tell, gives you the idea of igniting a fire, igniting a fire. And I think this is a good metaphor to uh, have you understand that you should have an animated conversation uh, which is not necessarily aggressive or angry. So animated. Uh, but not uh, aggressive. So an experience on the topics of experience and the experiences that actually are based on knowledge on the part of students in school, uh, having someone leading the conversation, not simply posing uh, questions and receiving answers and uh, organizing moments in which one can discuss what we learn and study are necessary. That's a good challenge because the time of school gets reduced. So you need to make other choices. You have to leave other things out and you have to trust yourself that if you do that, then probably certain things will be discussed by young people and maybe study them by themselves. This is one point that I would like to do. In other words, we should do we should make, we should turn school a way of intentional encounter. So these moments of common communication sh should not uh, uh, take place by chance, but they should be uh, actually intentional. Maybe I shouldn't say this on the occasion of the meeting, but I think that we should focus on these words. 
Uh, let me uh, make the example and quote some other people. There was a young people, a survey on university people. These young people once said, the Italian school proposes beautiful content. I translated a lot and I translated Seneca, but nobody asked me what I thought about uh, Seneca's thoughts. This is a sentence which is uh, symbolic. I translated Seneca, I was interested in him. We corrected the translation. We never discussed what I thought, what we thought about that thought. And I think that those who spoke it as meaning did, does that. But actually, very, very often, uh, this happens. A five-year-old child, uh, the ones uh, actually I normally meet the most, uh, said another thing. Uh, he was talking about a conversation with other child, with other children. How can one? Uh, uh, know that one knows. Uh, and actually the question was, uh, does the cat know that it's a cat? Uh, this is a good philosophical question. And another child said, to know things one needs to talk. If you don't uh, speak about things, you don't know them. Uh, and that too is uh, quite uh, uh, a nice thought together with the question on the cat. So conversing and reasoning together implies uh, two um, thoughts, uh, two views that get to know. So we uh, talk, we listen to others, technically listen to others, and we think about that, we remember that thought, we try and understand that, and possibly repropose that thought to understand if we uh, understood well. And then there is also empathic resonance. But this is a very first level uh, rigorous way of thinking. So try to understand the thought, reflecting to understand that, uh, and interpret what the others say, and then to have an exchange and compare our understanding of what we said and our interpretation of what the other person intends to say. So if you are experienced in uh, inter intercultural uh, context, you know that misunderstandings and misinterpretations can be very fruitful. Sometimes uh, these misunderstandings uh, lead to understanding and they lead to other ideas that uh, um, give us a different way of what we said. So from this point of view, experience uh, and experience with the language of the others and with the contexts of the others can be fundamental and precious if it is done rigorously and calmly and with, uh, uh, in a polite way. So I'm going to skip a couple of passages. This is needed. This element, uh, this encounter and reflection, joint uh, reflection, uh, which is uh, rigorous on what we think, uh, is needed because it leads us uh, to another, the development of another skill already mentioned by the other speakers. Uh, which is the capacity of children to read and interpret correctly, and then maybe to adapt uh, or not to the context. Uh, and this reading of contexts, uh, school contexts and living contexts, which are increasingly diversified and difficult to interpret. Uh, one should stop, observe, listen, and ask and then try and understand what is taking place. This process of, uh, in a way, interpretation of contexts is fundamental in order not to develop prejudice or detachment. This is an element that stems from uh, communication practices on uh, important contents and experiences. And that's yet another task of uh, the school. So thinking together. Uh, times are even shorter, but I think that this time is necessary. One should think together, listening to the thought of the others, trying to understand. The time devoted to listening and argumentation that uh, we sometimes complain to be absent in uh, the um, assignments, written assignments, uh, or in the speeches of uh, young people. For example, in America, uh, written assignments are uh, proven to be, are evidence to be more creative, uh, at least in, uh, in America. However, this argumentative capacity in writing has uh, uh, decreased, and these are elements that we should think about. And I hope this is also not the result of our school, because our young people should be multilingual in this respect. So this is an exercise, uh, that of conversation, 
and the understanding of context is an, an exercise of social intelligence which is fundamental and requires a, a very important reflection to understand different contexts. Let me give you a small example to draw back to what Monopoly said when he talked about Islamic culture. This is an example taken from a dissertation of a student uh, who won uh, uh, the test and is now teaching in a scientific uh, lyceum in Lombardy. And for his dissertation, he compared the way that primary school pupils uh, in Islam countries, uh, uh, the way they address a text, uh, so the way they address a text and learn it by heart, uh, and this, there's this uh, um, memory exercise with another text, for example, the way in which that text was presented to children in which the Islamic culture was presented. Both ways are unsatisfactory, but from both of them, it is necessary to understand and reflect. So one can be free if we think and to do that, we need to listen to the others. We need to observe the others, get informed on the rules of a given context uh, to check our thought. And this is something that we need to be able to do in school. I think that it is necessary to do it also in school. Um, so even uh, the uh, this experience uh, at work and in the school should become a shared experience. So we are free if we respect other people's freedom. Uh, and to do that, we need to observe it. And we need to compare ourselves uh, and compare it with ours in a rigorous way. This makes us thinking that sometimes it is difficult and it is painful. Because sometimes it, this induces us to rethink and change and make up our mind. But today, this is required by the complexity of the world. We need to find the time and I think that this can give back hope and reduces fear. Thank you. Allora, prima di trarre le conclusioni. So I would like to ask uh, Luigi Berlinguer to uh, give his contribution and I also would like to uh, have an applause for the Vice Secretary to Cafondi. Io sono molto felice. I'm really glad to be here today. And we're glad to see you. Because um, I have been listening to many interesting things and many beautiful things. Things that are true, that are right, that I share completely. I came here today knowing that uh, Giorgio Vitadini would be chairing this session, Human Capital and Development. This is his message. This has always been his message. But we have gone beyond this here. There has been a great richness in the speeches. There have been uh, prestigious headmasters who took the word here. They were not the, the managers of schools. They were uh, managers and headmasters with a great culture, because a headmaster is an educational leader. He's not just a manager of an organization. And this has uh, emerged in a very clear way. At the same time, this tells us, as uh, Giorgio Vittadini said, 
when he talked about character skills. So the skills, the capabilities that have a certain value, if they go beyond technical skills that are necessary, but if it also has a component of behavior, personality. So this is in a way shapes a person, molds a person. And we know that this is what knowledge does. This is clear. But it actually creates a person that will then carry out a certain specific task. So here we have to be very clear. And this is something that is actually in, in, in development. I have v visited certain exhibitions here at the meeting. And I must say that also the theme of uh, working, this is something that uh, can no longer be seen just as employment, so a living condition of human beings. But this has to be seen as uh, a profession. A job is a profession. So um, a job where the social being working expresses their qualified production skills. And this leads to a complete human being that produces, works, contributes to the collective richness, to the development of society, and continues improving his or her knowledge and uses them in his or her work. So this is the name, the, the noun we, we gave it today. It's profession rather than job with a, a certain component of uh, social justice as well. So at the moment, the connection between working, that is to say, uh, a social being that gives back a certain richness to society, society but does so in uh, giving voice to his uh, personality. So this is something new in the past. We just believe there is no development without education, but that was just an empty slogan, actually. And it was not really something in which people who had to invest in, in education believed. But today, this educational growth of society is seen as a true requisite for the entire society. And then here, Well, everyone have their own job. So uh, this is something I really believe in. When I talk about school, I say school for everyone and for uh, every single person. So this is, the, this is the ethical aspect of culture for and knowledge for everybody. So there has to be this ethical aspect, but there also is a, a personal contribution that each of us can give. And uh, this is something that is subjective and objective at the same time. And this changes the way of teaching today. So if we add to this another uh, important thought, uh, that, that we have to go beyond education based on the notions on uh, teaching students uh, how to uh, do maths, for instance. And we have uh, oh, a school that encourages also the uh, and artistic uh, um, capabilities and skills of uh, 
students, uh, even though it doesn't have to be Picasso or Beethoven. So we need to add in our educational culture the fact that without music there is no school, no education because uh, you are not a person of knowledge because you can add uh, two plus two, but then uh, you don't know what uh, your self tells you in terms of production of artistic sounds. Art is what will change the old school model that was too rigid based on notions that do not uh, give uh, students what they need to have. So this is the great hindrance we encounter. Without hearers, without pleasure, without really um, savoring what you're studying, and well, it has to be studying has to be an effort. Otherwise, we will not have the school that it has been described here today. So this is why I'm so happy today because here today I really perceived a certain optimism because, uh, well, uh, which is a, a determined optimism that does not give up. So we cannot uh, say we want a different school if we do not believe in this as the only way today to qualify the single person with all its personality. Thank you. Well, it seems to me that this uh, thrilling contribution by Luigi Berlinguer Well, it seems to me that this really wonderful, thrilling uh, contribution of Luigi Berlinguer uh, sums up three main factors that we've learned today. First, uh, to draw back to what Zanella said, overcoming uh, the Hercules uh, uh, columns. In other words, one needs to get into the personality of uh, young people. We should not uh, uh, stop before uh, predefined structures. We need to meet a person. Probably many of us would have liked to have the experience of that guy, of that young girl or woman who, who said, you are finally looking at me. You, we need to look at people. Uh, we need to get into their personality. Otherwise, they run the risk of being invisible. We've all been invisible, but the truest part of us was invisible. Each and any one of us uh, actually uh, had uh, made uh, the experience of Saint-Exupéry uh, that actually he was read as something different, uh, that they were div they were seen uh, as a hat and not as an elephant uh, in an inner way. And actually we would feel something else inside us. And this is the task of the school. The school has to discover what's uh, truly inside of us. Second point, this shouldn't be done outside the teaching hours, as Anna Frigerio said. It's inside the matter. It's the fascinating thing inside the matter. Things uh, finally are together. Otherwise, uh, we run the risk that certain Catholic schools are like the others, and then outside, you have other activities going on, and you have uh, uh, the times in which you go to Mass. Uh, so you have uh, the strong time. In other words, the important is the time that you spend inside the school. This issue has to be emerged from the inside. You, we have to personify w w what takes on inside. So three months ago, I followed. Uh, I was uh, participating in the lecture of uh, Professor Cesana at Sacro Cuore, who held a two-hour class on uh, Oedipus. Uh, and there were 800 people listening to him. They were all fascinated because uh, 
he was more fascinating in actually doing that class than actually witnessing and watching a soccer game. He was fascinating. So we need to, in a way, have this diversity emerge inside the school class with imagination and not simply, and not simply that uh, in a way you are adding your contribution afterwards, not because you are contributing your ideology, but because you contribute to have anything emerge. And then in the end, you can have everything emerge. So lots of positions fascinated by that uh, school class. Third passage, the school is an institution. So this leads me to this. Uh, very original opinion of Michele Ponopoli and Susanna Mantovani. So an institution which is a place of encounter, it's a dialogue. You don't have uh, only the individuals, but you have people gathering together. Otherwise, you run the risk of having schools in which a public school, in which you have uh, the person in charge of the integration, uh, hours for integration, and then she gets into a class uh, and someone is teaching, uh, and this person actually wants uh, to, in a way, have uh, a person uh, out of the a Pakistani student uh, for basically uh, additional classes uh, to do the so-called integration classes. And if that person uh, does not get off the school, Actually, that person won't understand anything. In other words, we need to uh, reason and think together. We need to have uh, uh, people who are capable of communicating between each other. We need dialogue to emerge. Many of the things we've said about uh, many of the ideological things we've said actually stem from the fact because we are, do not listen to the other. If I'm a communist and I listen to the Catholic, uh, well, I can learn a little bit. And if I am an agnostic, I can become a believer. And then in the end, uh, uh, maybe I don't know what I become. But it's, uh, it is good like that. We shouldn't focus on ideologies. Ideologies are over. The world should be based on dialogue. It sometimes appears to me that when I uh, listen people uh, actually talking about something uh, that are of a different opinion than me, well, I tend to share their ideas. And then people say that actually we, um, I, ca I get contaminated. This means that I am not a wall. Uh, so I would like to conclude because the school proposed today is exactly the one we want to have. If I wear, uh, the other day I made the example of that apple, because if I wear uh, Newton, if I had been Newton, I would have condemned uh, actually the farm for aggression. You can conceive a law simply because you listen to an example. And if you are open, you can maybe make up your mind. I'm listening to the nice book by Bersanelli on this. And many of the big discoveries uh, actually stem simply by looking at reality that modified the previous way of thinking. I could change a reality because that was not in line with what I thought. Yesterday, I happened to read that the mm, uh, satellites were first in the east and then in the west. In other words, theories can get changed looking at examples and actually a school has to be a change in theory because in the end of the year you do no longer understand if your professor is a communist or an agnostic there has been a way of rethinking because intelligent people change idea they make up their mind and young people students are happy about that so we should uh, go on in mixing ideas because it is uh, not nice for those who say that we no longer have an identity identity i don't want to have that identity I want to be a stateless person. I want to become increasingly stateless by changing other people's ideas. So let's go on like this. We might go on discussing also, for example, uh, in the area of, uh, uh, in the area school for meeting. And let's go on uh, supporting the meeting with the Dona Ora, with the fundraising campaign of the meeting, uh, with this self donations. Because only this way we can be freer. The more money we give ourselves, uh, the less servants we will be of other masters. And this is very important today.